The exotic pet trade makes for great Instagramming. But people with weird pets are seriously messing up the environment and costing us millions of dollars in the process. Hello everyone, I'm Trace, as you may know, and today we have a special guest from Shed Science, Sally LePage. Hi Sally. Hello, thanks for having me. Welcome. Every year, pet owners are faced with the dilemma of what to do with unwanted companions. In Boulder, Colorado, a handful of goldfish were released into a local lake, and now there are thousands of them. Goldfish are actually carp, like the well-known koi carp. They're native to Japan, so they've got no natural predators here in the US. They could be carrying viruses, and if they escape lakes and head downstream, they could outcompete native fish, some of which are already threatened. You may think of him as cute little Mr. Bubbles. What harm could he possibly do? But removing these species costs the government a lot of money and time. And it's not just our goldfish. In 1890, a fan of William Shakespeare named Eugene Shefflin wanted to bring the birds from Shakespeare's works into his home of New York. He released 100 starlings that are native to Europe, Asia, Africa, and Australia into Central Park. And by 1928, those 100 birds had bred so much that the population reached the Mississippi River. By 1942, they had spread all the way to California, forming flocks of as many as a million hungry birds, driving off native species like bluebirds and woodpeckers. And today, there are an estimated 200 million starlings flying around North America, costing $800 million in damage to agriculture every year and unknown millions in damage to the airline industry through bird strikes. They even caused a plane crash in 1960. It's not just the waterways and skies harboring introduced species. Oh, no, no, no. There are two states which bear the brunt of these animals, Florida and Hawaii. In a 20-year Florida study, they found 56 different non-native species completely established in America's favorite little dangly state. Pythons are a well-known invader, but what about the newest reptilian invader, the Argentine tegu? This black and white lizard is just starting to breed and spread into parts of the state. How do they get there? Exotic pet release. Their study found 84% of all introduced species in Florida came from exotic pets. Tegus grow up to four feet in length and lay 35 eggs a year. Once established, they'll compete with feral cats and dogs, as well as native animals like raccoons. Florida's also home to wild hogs. Not that better than expected John Travolta movie. No. Literally wild pigs. Yeah. The hogs were introduced in the 1500s by the Spanish. But Europeans have their invaders too, like the red-eared slider or terrapin. It's from the Mississippi Valley, but it's been found as far away as Europe and Asia. The red-eared slider females are larger than most native turtles, so they can out-eat, out-mate, and out-breed. And apparently most male native turtles like the larger ladies. And indeed, who wouldn't? You see, bigger females make more eggs, so of course they're more attractive to the males. As years go by, more and more non-native species get spread around, even trees. The Norway maple, a beautiful tree, grows so fast and has such dense shade, it displaces native trees, shrubs, and herbs, as well as flowers, which affects the native forest life. And trees are essential for some species of forest life. And the Norway maple outcompetes native maples for resources, causing the native tree populations to die and affecting the animals that live in and around them. Just don't plant them. But if you aren't into cutting down beautiful maple trees, even if they are invasive, you could help by getting an environmentally friendly car. The new Toyota Mirai is looking to the future with sustainability in mind, fueled by hydrogen and leaving zero emissions behind. Now that California and other southwestern regions are beginning to react to this massive drought, chances are we'll see more native plants and landscaping that require less water and are more suited to our habitat is probably good. There are solutions to the drought, but desalination isn't going to do it. For more on that, check out Julian's video here. It can only make 10% of the county's needs, and it'll use a lot of energy because it's forcing pressurized water through a membrane to separate the water from the salt in a process called reverse osmosis. And thank you for watching. Also, you can come find Sally. Where can they come find you? They can come find me on youtube.com forward slash shed science. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Bye.